Hello and welcome to this talk about the cloud native journey at Adobe. I'm going to talk to you about how we use Kubernetes and other CNCF projects, what went uh, well, what things didn't work. So hopefully you'll learn some lessons that will help you on your own teams and uh, join me in this, in this journey. So I'm a cloud engineer at the Adobe Experience Manager Cloud Service. This is a product that uh, I'll give more details, uh, part of the Adobe portfolio and, and have a background on open source. I wrote, uh, started the Jenkins Kubernetes plugin and I contributed at uh, Jenkins X, Apache Maven for many years, Eclipse Foundation, etc. Uh, so my background is a lot on the, on the open source community. So Adobe Experience Manager, what it, what it is, uh, so we can understand better what are the challenges we have to go through. So this applies to my team inside this uh, Adobe Experience Manager cloud service that we, we started announcing uh, at the beginning of this year. But there's other teams at, uh, in AM, uh, Adobe Experience Manager. There's uh, many teams in Adobe, uh, a lot of them uh, using Kubernetes too. So this, just so you know, applies to, to my team. Adobe Experience Manager is a content management system, digital asset management, uh, enrollment forms, and it's used for, uh, by many Fortune 100 companies. Um, companies uh, you you already know and are already customers of, of the Adobe Experience Manager. And now we are providing this cloud service. It's an existing distributed job application. Um, you have author instances where authors can create content, publish instances where visitors can see that content that was created, and this can all scale horizontally. So this already existed before uh, the move to Kubernetes. This has been already around for years. The stack is using J Java with OSGI and a lot of open source components from the Apache Software Foundation. There's a huge mass market for extension developers that write modules that run on AM in process. And I'll go through why this is important to, to understand uh, later on. The challenge for us was to run Adobe Experience Manager on Kubernetes. So getting into it, we are running on Azure. We have more than 10 clusters and we keep adding clusters. Multiple regions, US, Europe, Australia, and more coming. And uh, we have at Adobe a dedicated team managing clusters for multiple products. So it's not that we don't create the clusters ourselves, there's another team that takes care of that. AM environments, uh, so multi every customer can have multiple AM environments that they can self-serve, so they can create environments on their own. And for each customer, we have at least three namespaces like development, stage, production environments. We also have sandboxes that are evaluation-like environments. And all of this is uh, managed by the customer themselves through a Cloud Manager, which is a separate services that, service that has their own uh, its own web UI and API. So customers can have uh, multiple environments that match to multiple Kubernetes namespaces. On the names on the environments, the, for us the namespaces provide the scope like network isolation, quotas, permissions. So we use that that Kubernetes give us already, and uh, for each environment we use a lot of init containers, uh, Satka containers to apply division of concerns. So um, we have sidecar containers that do storage initialization or we have HTTPD fronting the Java application or exporting metrics. We also use FluentBit to send logs. And uh, another example is have a Java thread dump collection where uh, we gather the thread dumps and, and store them. So we have several sidecars 
custom developed, like the thread dump collector, the storage initialization that are very particular to our use case, open source like Flow and Beat, and some that we extended from, from open source like HTTPD. And we have to scale these to hundreds of customers, thousands of sandboxes. So for us, that, that's the, the, the big, it's a big challenge to, to make sure that this, whatever we build uh, services we built around it, uh, they will scale. Some of the issues we face with the scaling, uh, you can run uh, on Azure API rate limits, uh, especially in up rates. So we have to limit each cluster to a few hundred nodes. Uh, so you could solve this also having bigger nodes. So you get high, bigger cluster sizes with the same number of nodes. And we use the Kubernetes vertical and horizontal pod auto scaler extensively. For about the vertical pod auto scaler, we use it to scale down, up and down on memory and CPU. But this JVM footprint is, is hard to reduce, right? Uh, if you are aware of how Java applications work, memory, you basically uh, reserve the memory on a startup, set the heap size, and then it's up to the JVM to manage that memory. One thing you have to be careful with the vertical pod auto scaler is that changes to the request need pod restarts to become effective and make sure that you don't set the VPA to do it automatically because otherwise you would get some random pod restarts and depending on your application that may be a problem. We also use the horizontal pod auto scaler and we set it to scale up on requests per minute. And one thing that uh, you have to be aware of is that you cannot use the same metrics for HPA and VPA. That's on the documentation of Kubernetes. One service we built to manage uh, the scale of the clusters, uh, we implemented something that we call hibernation for environment, uh, environments that are used by engineering and sandboxes that are randomly used. So we uh, scale down these environments and this allows us to overbook clusters and, and save uh, a lot of money by doing that and putting, being able to put more resources into, into one cluster. How this works is very simple. We have a Kubernetes job that checks uh, Prometheus metrics. If there is an activity in the last n number of hours, we scale a bunch of deployments down to zero. The customer, the user is showing a message to the hibernate by clicking a button. And that's, that's all there is to it. I and mean, this, this uh, allows us to scale the clusters and get more uh, packing in, in the clusters. Ideally, we, it would just dehibernate automatically right on a new request like uh, functions as a service, Knative, these sort of, uh, of things. But you have to account that JVMs uh, in, in this product, it takes uh, around five minutes to start depending on how much content you have, how many uh, things you have on, on the store. But um, Unless you use new JVM micro frameworks, uh, the JVM, if you are taking an existing application, it's probably going to take a, a good amount of time to start. Networking, we, we use uh, the networking capabilities from Kubernetes, which is it's a bit complex and we have to account for multi-tenancy. We are running multiple customers on the same uh, cluster. So we limit things. So uh, services cannot connect to other services in other namespaces. And we block everything by default and we open uh, a specific uh, cases as needed. So we start from a fully blocked and then open, open as needed. Everything is virtual, um, Kubernetes networking. This allows flexibility, but introduces complexity, of course. But this is managed uh, by Kubernetes. And we had some issues, but uh, 
overall it works, it can work pretty well. We use Cilium for networking and uses eBPF instead of IP tables, it's more efficient and performant and allows us to have custom network policies at level 7, so things like um, policies on path, HTTP headers, HTTP methods, so it's a, it's a higher level um, API that allows us to, to define more fine-grained constraints. We use the network policy object to block or allow traffic. We block access to all the other namespaces and we just allow some outgoing HTTPS and common ports. Customers may also want to allow specific uh, things like uh, IGRIS IPs, uh, say we have a, you have a development environment and it can only be accessed by your IP range of your uh, private network. So we can, uh, we can do that too. For ingress, we're using a contour fork uh, that has more features and uh, also has more features than the standard Kubernetes ingress object. Uh, so we use block list, allow list, path-based routing, stuff like that. And it uses Envoy uh, behind the scenes. So we, use, uh, we heavily use Envoy. Envoy is uh, something that is like a kind of love-hate relationship where uh, you can do things, it can break in many different ways and it can break badly. Uh, so it's, uh, if you have, have Envoy misconfigured, then uh, you can cause a cluster-wide outage. And like if your configuration, you update your configuration and it's wrong, and then you restart Envoy, it will clear all the Envoy routes. So you get a cluster-wide outage. And we have issues uh, when the rate of changes is too high, when it, it gets uh, uh, locked and, and things just uh, uh, cr start, start crawling, back, uh, crawling down. But it's very, very powerful. And we had to do some work to fix issues and to use it correctly. And things that we do, for instance, now is uh, validation of all the configs, both at build time and run time. So this is to prevent ha causing any, any problems. As I said, it's very powerful, but if you do something wrong, it's being used everywhere and uh, can cause a cluster-wide outage. For logging, uh, we use FluentBit sidecars that sends logs to centralized store. We also use Grafana Locky for, for log aggregation. And for monitoring and alerting, uh, typical Prometheus Grafana. And then we aggregate all the clusters data and we have alerts coming from Alert Manager. So that's very typical stack. We have a feature that is the customer logging, so customers can also need access to some of these logs. And we use FluentBit to send the logs to either Logstash and recently Loki. And the customer can see them on this Cloud Manager UI and get, get those logs and see what uh, whatever it's in the logs on both from the application or their custom code. Logstash, for instance, we are moving away from it because it's a uh, JVM heavy and uh, it uses a lot of memory and uh, we're thinking that uh, Loki, Loki is a better option for, for these multi-tenant services. Resiliency and self-healing, some things that you have to ha be aware of. So you have to have readiness, liveness probes, Make sure that uh, your services are, are marked unavailable if there's any problem and that they are restarted automatically. If, if in a case something goes wrong, you have to have pod disruption budgets to ensure you have a minimum number of replicas and rollouts and then cluster operates. So make sure that 
uh, you always have one pod running of a specific service if you want or 50% of the pods. So they are not automatically killed by Kubernetes. And pod anti-affinity to distribute the services across nodes and, and availability zones. Because if we have multiple availability zones, you got to make sure that not all the pods will end in the same availability zone. So you want to use this pod anti-affinity to uh, spread out the load across HCs. So we're building a multi very multi-tenant service. Uh, so we try to always, everything we write, limit the blast radius. Uh, as I said before, customers are namespace isolated. We, make, we enforce that all the deployments have CPU and memory requests and limits. So this is key. We are also running customer code. So this is an interesting topic because um, basically a customer can write something that can take down or cause trouble to their instances. We run checks before that code goes into, into the, uh, the production clusters. But um, there's always that, that risk. So uh, these pods, uh, we are started testing Carta containers where the pod runs in a virtual machine transparently. So it's a very nice project. It's, it's transparent. You keep using your kubectl APIs and the command line and APIs. And we are also uh, um, developers from this other team that manage the, the Kubernetes cluster for us are contributing improvements upstream. So we are uh, helping improve Kata containers. External services we use we not, don't run everything on Kubernetes. We do have uh, like external MongoDB and that's that's running outside the cluster. We use Azure Blob Storage, these two things for persistence. And we don't use much uh, Kubernetes persistent volumes because it's a bit risky. Obviously, it's, it's better if you don't need to use them. There's just that some people need to use them because of their existing applications and so on. But uh, especially in Azure, uh, we found that we hit the uh, Azure API rate, rate limiting when having hundreds of persistent volumes. Uh, it's been a few months since, since that happened, but we stopped using them and uh, using other options more like uh, external storage for, for data. For data processing, we have a service based on Kafka, and this allows us to do syncing, syncing of data between author and publish. And this works world, worldwide when we have publishers in multiple regions, because um, customers that create content may have um, publishers and publishing uh, information, publishing their websites and their data and their assets into multiple regions. And this uh, Kafka service, Kafka-based service allows us to, to sync all these regions. For CDN, we use Fastly in front of your Kubernetes load balancer. And it also uh, fronts the binary content that we store in Azure blobs. One new feature that we have to build, for instance, was an egress dedicated IP. So customers want to, to have a dedicated IP for either firewall configuration and the egress IP, either firewall configuration or to be embedded throttle or blocked by other tenants, right? If you have multiple tenants coming out of your cluster, there's a range of IPs that is used and it's shared across all, all tenants. So we can provide customers with a dedicated IP and they, it's uh, exclusive for, for these customers. So we build this uh, setting a scale set of proxies outside of the Kubernetes cluster and with their own load balancer. And this is dedicated for each customer. 
and we use the network policies to allow only the customer to access the proxy. So a proxy can go out to the internet, all the, the pods, sorry, the pods can go out, of the customer can go out to the internet through this proxy, and this will set a dedicated IP that is only uh, used for that customer. For continuous delivery, how are we managing this? We move from a uh, yearly on the non-cloud version of the product to a daily release on Kubernetes. So this has its own challenges. We use Jenkins mostly for CI CD and we use some also queues to trigger some jobs. There's, there's a Jenkins plugin that can do that for you. We use extensively GitOps, all the configuration is storing Git and reconcile on each commit. And we have a model of pull versus pulling, so we can scale, right? If you have to push the configuration from Jenkins to all the clusters and all the namespaces and so on, this is not going to scale. And we have services in the cluster that are pulling this data and, and doing the reconciliation. For Kubernetes deployments, we use a combination of Helm for the Adobe Experience Manager application. We also use plain Kubernetes files for some services. And we also use customize for some new microservices that we build. So we have a mix of, of all of them. We use extensively Helm and things that we learn is like don't mix application and infrastructure configuration in the same package because then it makes it hard and uh, if you need to make a change because some infrastructure change then you will have to redeploy all these helm uh, releases we have thousands of them and helm also needs to push to all namespaces and it's easier pulling, so we are moving towards the Helm operator that will improve this situation. Things we use during CI and CD to make sure things don't break are kubeval to validate the Kubernetes schemas. And we have some custom CRDs and we created uh, schemas for those two. So every pull request, every change goes through QVAL validation. It also goes through ConfTest using uh, op open policy agents, uh, open policy agent rules. So we validate uh, every object in Kubernetes with ConfTest rules. So developers can you still create pull requests and and see the the output of of the of these rules and they still have autonomy they can see uh what they should do what are the best practices by by having these rules so are things like security recommendations labeling labeling standards image sources like you want to make sure that all your uh docker images are coming from a specific registry and not from from other ones and this it's very helpful for for um letting developers manage their own services and their own features so a lot on the on the self-service part so that's it i hope you um enjoy the, and get some examples on how these technologies are being used in a, like a real life use case uh, existing application because a lot of times we talk about kubernetes and this all like greenfield development every new applications with the latest technologies so this i hope it uh, shows how you can bring an existing application an existing um service that has not initially been thought of uh, on the kubernetes world how you can bring something like that into kubernetes kubernetes makes it really easy to do this lift and shift into into kubernetes of something that is already running 
and I hope you got some ideas and that uh, it helps you. Thank you for being here. And uh, we are hiring. If you know any of these uh, technologies that I mentioned today, let me know. You can ping me on Twitter and also you can ask me any questions now. Thank you.